hello everyone. Thank you for having me today to lead your refresher training session on hand hygiene and environmental cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization for the environmental health care service staff. My name is Allison Thurber, and I'm a public health nurse at the Rhode Island Department of Health, and a training liaison for Project First Line Rhode Island. So this training is delivered to you by Project First Line Rhode Island at the Center for Acute Infectious Disease Epidemiology in partnership with the CDC. I myself have a varied background of experience in nursing, and while all of my roles have required different skill sets, one thing that has remained a constant is my applied knowledge of infection control. So if along the way you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. So that should be at the bottom of your screen unless you have gone ahead and moved that tab up to the top of your screen. And we'll answer all of those questions at the very end of today's webinar in our live Q&A. Also, please take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat feature in this webinar. Tell us where you're from, where you work, um, possibly what your job title is, if you feel comfortable sharing that. And lastly, if you haven't done so already, please take a moment to fill out the pre-session survey that we have placed in the chat. This is a required survey if you are interested in receiving the certificate of training. So our agenda for today will include introductions, hand hygiene, definitions of cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, practical applications of cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, some key takeaways, resources, references, end of session feedback, and then our Q&A. Alrighty, so I'd like to take a moment to just welcome everyone to today's webinar, whether this is your first session or whether you're joining us again. Looks like um, from the chat already, we have a great mix of healthcare staff attending today. This means that some of the aspects of our course may seem simplistic, but it is important for the concepts to build upon each other. And as most of us know, some of the most simple actions and concepts are the ones that make the most impact. It could include clinical staff that regularly partake in disinfecting in a healthcare facility, and of course, it includes our dedicated EVS staff that specialize in preventing the spread of germs by cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization practices. Differentiate between cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, and to understand when and how to clean versus disinfect versus sterilize. And we will start with a little poll question. So CDC recommends the use of alcohol-based hand sanitizers as the primary method for hand hygiene in most healthcare situations. A poll will pop up on your screen. Go ahead and select your best answer, true or false. So again, CDC recommends the use of alcohol-based hand sanitizers as the primary method for hand hygiene in most healthcare situations. Is this true or is this false? Hand rubs are generally less irritating to your hands and are an effective method of cleaning your hands. But there are certain times when hand washing should be used instead, and it's very specific, and we will discuss that next. So here before you, like I just mentioned, are different situations where you would need to clean your hands. And we'll go through each task together and discuss which type of hand hygiene is recommended, either hand washing with soap and water or with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. So first, after caring for a patient with C. diff, spores, or known infectious diarrhea. That is the time when it is recommended that you wash your hands with soap and water. Um, you need to wash off those spores. They are not killed by an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Next, uh, immediately before touching a patient, it is perfectly acceptable at this point to use alcohol-based hand sanitizer. When your hands are visibly soiled, it is recommended that you use soap and water to wash away any sort of visible soiled debris. Before performing an aseptic task or handling invasive medical devices, again, it's perfectly acceptable to use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, as well as after contact with blood, body fluids, or contaminated surfaces. Uh, the one caveat here would be if your hands were visibly soiled after touching the blood, body fluids, or contaminated surfaces, that's when you would need to use soap and water. Before eating, it's also recommended that you wash your hands with soap and water and after using the restroom. After glove removal, alcohol-based hand sanitizer would be great. After touching a patient or the patient's immediate environment, again, alcohol-based hand sanitizer is perfect there as well as when you're moving from a soiled body site to a clean body site on the same patient. So again, in healthcare, it is recommended to use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer to perform hand hygiene, except when hand washing is indicated. And those instances to summarize 
are when you're caring for a patient with C. diff or a patient that has infectious diarrhea or spores that are not killed by an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. When your hands are visibly dirty, before you eat, after using the restroom, and special circumstances, like if you're scrubbing in for surgery, or for an example, if you work in psychiatric services, um, alcohol-based hand sanitizer may be contraindicated. In that case, you would have to wash your hands with soap and water. Let's go over some details about hand washing. So soap and water removes all harmful bacteria if performed correctly with antimicrobial soap in healthcare settings. So CDC recommends that when you're cleaning your hands with soap and water, you first wet your hands with water, apply the amount of recommended product to your hands and rub your hands together vigorously for 15 to 20 seconds. Make sure that you cover all the surface of your hands and fingers. And then you rinse your hands with water and use the disposable towels to dry your hands. Then use a disposable towel to make sure you turn off that faucet if it does have a manual turn knob. And avoid using hot water to prevent the drying of your skin. So for alcohol-based hand sanitizers, you would put the product on your hands and rub your hands together. Cover all surfaces until your hands feel dry. And altogether, this usually takes around 20 seconds. Again, this is the most commonly recommended in healthcare facilities because it has been linked to higher rates of compliance. Steps seem much simpler than if you were hand washing and having to deal with paper towels. Um, but there are those times that you do need to hand wash. An alcohol-based hand sanitizer kills most harmful bacteria when it's performed correctly. So is this question true or false? It is best to use the hottest tolerable water to wash your hands. The heat will help kill the germs. Is that true or is that false? Go ahead and select your best answer on the screen there. A true, B false. All right. So here on this slide, we have some of the frequently asked questions about hand hygiene. Um, and we'll just kind of go through them. Feel free if you have any questions about these questions or anything else to add it in the Q&A box. We'll answer them at the end of the session. So first commonly asked question is, is it safe to wear nail polish at work? So hand hygiene does have decreased effectiveness in the presence of chipped nails. So freshly applied nail polish does not increase the number of bacteria on the skin, but chipped nail polish supports the growth of larger numbers of organisms on your fingernails. So if you're choosing to wear nail polish, make sure it's not chipped. Another frequently asked question or misnomer, do you need to wash your hands if you wear gloves? So gloves protect you, but they also protect your patients and your coworkers. So use gloves when indicated and change them in between patients and in between tasks. Do not wear gloves in between tasks or when not indicated. Glove use is certainly not a substitute for hand hygiene. So we always recommend cleaning your hands after removing gloves because dirty gloves can soil your hands. Another frequently asked question is if alcohol-based hand sanitizers contribute to antibiotic resistance. And the short answer here is no. Alcohol-based hand sanitizers kill germs, including antibiotic resistant germs, by destroying the proteins and protective outer membranes that germs need to survive. Antibiotic resistance, on the other hand, happens when germs like bacteria and fungi develop the ability to defeat the drugs that were designed to kill them. And that is not the case here. And lastly, where can you find materials and resources for yourselves and your staff? CDC has a Clean Hands Count campaign, and they provide hand hygiene visuals and educational materials for healthcare worker staff and patients in multiple languages. Um, so we have added the link to the Clean Hands Count campaign to our post-session resources that you will receive after today's webinar if you're interested in having this material, as well as our chat here. So feel free to um, access that material after. All right, so moving on to cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. Cleaning and disinfection of environmental surfaces is fundamental to reduce potential healthcare-associated infections and the further spread of germs. The healthcare environment contains a diverse population of microorganisms, and contaminated surfaces are a great place for germs to hang out. So if you think of it, Many patients that are seeking healthcare at an outpatient office or a hospital are immunocompromised. And environmental germs can affect these patients more than others and put them at risk for death and serious injury. So 
It is our duty to protect these patients and processes like cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization can do that. All right, so cleaning. Thorough cleaning is required before high-level disinfection and sterilization because materials that remain on surfaces of instruments interfere with the effectiveness of these processes. So this includes in routine environmental cleaning as well as as-needed cleanings after use of equipment and instruments. Some items that should be cleaned include instruments prior to disinfection and sterilization, non-critical items, which are items that come into contact with intact skin that are not shared between patients like walkers and crutches, items that are visibly soiled, and routine objects and high-touch surfaces. So consider an example of something that needs to be cleaned prior to disinfecting to be cutlery at an assisted living facility. So the debris must be cleaned off the cutlery prior to going into the dishwasher. Otherwise, the debris could crust on and then will remain on the utensils. So without effective cleaning, sterilization would not be effective in that case. So here we have some surfaces that are commonly found in a healthcare setting that we may need to clean. And forgive me because I'm not a pro at this laser pointer. Um, but we have a chair and a table that could be cleaned prior to disinfecting. You have a, a tabletop in an exam room, a mirror in an outpatient exam room, it looks like, and also a rug that could be vacuumed prior to being disinfected. And lastly, a step on scale over here. Common cleaning products include soaps and detergents and mechanical cleaners or friction. Fluidics is fluid under pressure. And this process or method is used to remove soil and debris after brushing when the object doesn't allow for effective brushing. An example in our everyday life could be a pressure washer to clean a patio, right? There's so many nooks and crannies, you just couldn't get in there with a brush. So you would use a pressure washer and that's fluid under pressure. So I would like to give you an opportunity to reflect on the different surfaces that you have come in contact with in your specific workplace that require cleaning. So some things to think about. How do you clean those surfaces? How often do you clean those surfaces? Is it a routine schedule or only when you see that it is visibly soiled? And who cleans those surfaces? Do you have dedicated staff? Is it clinical staff? Are you not really sure? It's not really defined. So go ahead if you feel comfortable and put some of your thoughts in the chat box. Now pause here so we can just think about some of that. Wheelchairs, stretchers, stethoscopes, countertops, chairs over the bed tables. So a lot of things that require cleaning, some things potentially that require cleaning prior to disinfection, not just cleaning. Um, and we will go over some of those things next in disinfection, which you led me to a great segue, if I could. There we go. So transitioning to disinfection. So we spoke of cleaning as a process that removes the germs. Disinfection is a process that kills germs. So in healthcare settings, objects usually are disinfected by liquid chemicals. Disinfection can be viewed as a spectrum, and the spectrum starts at low-level disinfectants and goes through high-level disinfectants. So low-level disinfectants are used to disinfect non-critical items that come into contact with intact skin, and this includes shared patient care devices that staff would use on multiple patients through the course of any given day, including hard surfaces like bed rails and equipment like blood pressure cuffs. An example of a low-level disinfectant is alcohol wipes, so very common. Then there are intermediate-level disinfectants, and intermediate-level disinfectants are used to disinfect some critical items and some non-critical items. In the healthcare setting, this typically means workwear or linen, that may come into contact with bacteria, infectious material, and bloodborne pathogens. Intermediate disinfectants usually include some sort of bleach or bleach blend. And then there are high-level disinfectants. And high-level disinfectants are used on semi-critical items that will come into contact with either mucous membranes or non-intact skin. And this includes disinfectants that kill spores like C. diff. Sporicidal disinfectant products are traditionally used in surgical centers but they also may be kept in low-risk facilities in case disease outbreak occurs. And these products contain more dangerous ingredients. So that being said, they should be handled with extra caution. There should be appropriate PPE. 
and used by people who are specifically trained to use these products. Um, Some of these products include acids and hydrogen peroxides. So what should be disinfected? We went over this a little bit, but reusable non-critical medical devices like blood pressure cuffs, instruments used on patients that do not require further sterilization, items that are visibly soiled, routine objects and high touch surfaces, and surfaces with an unclear contamination source. So if you're not sure if that's Coca-Cola on the desktop versus blood or body fluid, you certainly want to disinfect. Also, if there's any uncertainty about a multi-drug resistant organism, also known as MDROs, as you can see on the screen. So some more examples of things that could be disinfected. So here you have a vitals cart in the corner. Uh, Usually that has a blood pressure cuff, pulse ox, thermometer sometimes, if it's like an external thermometer, the stretcher or bed that a patient is laying on. We have a stethoscope here that you could disinfect. So these are patient, uh, these are items that are shared by patients um, within a given day. And so this wouldn't be on their mucous membranes. So, but because the fact that it's shared by multiple patients, you would have to disinfect versus clean. So there are many important aspects to consider when you're choosing a disinfectant. And there is no perfect disinfectant, but it is important that you find a disinfectant with characteristics that meet most of your needs. So as leadership in a facility, you would want to consider how economical a product is or how broad or environmentally friendly a disinfectant is. As an everyday user, you possibly would want to consider surface compatibility or toxicity of the disinfectant. So for example, you wouldn't want to use a bleach solution on a rug or a couch, or you wouldn't want to use a slow acting or toxic disinfectant if you work on a children's unit. So after you choose the appropriate disinfectant, it's important to now disinfect the correct way so that it's effective and safe for all people involved in the process. So when it comes down to it, most importantly, always follow the directions on the label. The label will include safety information and application instructions. So let's go through a few important disinfecting actions, like ensuring adequate ventilation, for example, opening windows, using only the amount recommended, labeling any diluted cleaning or disinfectant solutions. So if you take anything out of the bottle and have to um, dilute it, make sure that that bottle that you put it in is now labeled so that if someone else goes to use it, they know what's in there. Store and use chemicals out of reach of children and pets. Uh, Do not mix products or chemicals and do not eat, drink, breathe, inject cleaning and disinfection products into your body or apply directly to your skin. So make sure you're not using those purple wipes to wipe your hands if you can't find hand sanitizer. All of this can cause serious harm. Providing readily accessible PPE, and spill kits, checking products periodically to be sure they're not expired, and providing appropriate ventilation for those areas where harmful chemicals may be used. So here is an example of a disinfectant label. And some of the things that you'll find on the label include the active ingredients, the EPA registration number, what PPE to use while working with the disinfectant, and the directions for use, contact time, First aid directions if by chance it gets into your eyes, nose, mouth, um, and how to store and dispose of the disinfectant. So this specific label that you're looking at can be downloaded from our website, projectfirstlineri.com in English and Spanish. Um, A direct link can also be found in the chat on this webinar, as well as in our post-session resources that we'll send to you after today's webinar. So in addition to the label, Each workplace is required to have safety data sheets for each chemical that they use within the facility. Safety data sheets, or SDSs, provide information similar to that on the label for healthcare staff to access in the workplace. The information contained in the safety data sheets must be in English, although it may be in other languages as well. And that's a great idea if you know that the staff in your facility use another primary language. So contact time is frequently referenced when you're considering and applying disinfectants. And contact time is also known as dwell or wet time. And it's the amount of time a disinfectant needs to sit on a surface without being wiped away or disturbed in any way. So this time is product and task specific. 
So contact time is important because the product you're using might not kill the germ right away. So when you're choosing a disinfectant, either for purchase at a facility by a supervisor or for use by frontline EVS staff, contact time should always be considered. Um, a room, for example, in the ER that is quickly turned over should not use a disinfectant with an extended contact time unless that room can be kept unoccupied until the time has lapsed. So if you're aware of what products, uh, unaware of what products to use or unsure in any way, uh, you should not worry because there are many resources available to you. Your first resource should be the equipment itself. So some equipment has labels which tell you what product is safe to use on it and how to use that product. Next, you could check the disinfectant label or safety data sheet to see what the cleaning or disinfecting product safely disinfects. You could then also ask your supervisor. And lastly, you could check the EPA website. So EPA registered means that the product is effective against the indicated pathogen if there is a known pathogen. So products are not allowed to make claims of effectiveness unless the agency has reviewed this data. So before you is a list of common disinfectants. And again, as we discussed, the choice of disinfectant, concentration of that disinfectant, and exposure time is based on the risk for infection and the equipment or surface. So be sure that you choose the right disinfectant for the job. And here we're going to do the same thing that we did for cleaning and just reflect on some of the different surfaces that you've come in contact with in your specific workplace that require disinfecting. So again, some reflection questions and feel free to add them in the chat. Um, for others to see uh, if you feel comfortable. But how do you disinfect these surfaces that you're thinking about? Are you using the appropriate disinfectant for the task? Is it routine disinfecting or is it as needed? Do you have to clean first? And who performs the disinfection? So again, if you feel comfortable, you can put some of your reflection into the chat, but don't feel obligated to do so. Just take a quick look at it. You have some countertops, glucometer. You definitely want to make sure that you're disinfecting the glucometer if you're using it in between patients. Shower chairs, transport chairs, dining room tables and chairs, scales, all of that stuff you'd want to disinfect. Some requires cleaning beforehand and some you wouldn't have to and you could just go ahead and disinfect. Workstations, great. All right, so last today we are going to review sterilization. So sterilization describes a process that destroys or eliminates all forms of microbial life and is carried out in healthcare facilities by physical or chemical methods. Critical items are items that are high risk for infection. And this includes objects that enter sterile tissue or the vascular system. And these items are items that require sterilization. So what should be sterilized? Again, critical items, ones that have higher potential for infection risk, objects that enter sterile tissue or the vascular system, and dental instruments that penetrate soft tissue and bone. Extraction forceps, scalpel blades, bone chisels, surgical burrs, all of that should be sterilized. Some photos of things we may sterilize. So on one side of your screen, you can see some dental instruments. On the other side of your screen, you can see an operating room. Uh, and in the OR, much of the equipment is invasive and considered a critical item. So therefore, most items in the OR would require sterilization. So here you can see some common sterilization methods used in healthcare facilities. Um, steam under pressure and liquid chemicals are most frequently used. And when chemicals are used to destroy all forms of microbiologic life, they are called chemical sterilants. So it's important that once things are sterilized, the products are stored appropriately so that they maintain their sterilization. And if sterilization for any reason is expected to be compromised, then do not use that product and sterilize that item again. So these products should be stored in an area that is well ventilated, provides protection against dust, moisture, insects, and temperature and humidity extremes. Store the sterile items so that packaging is not compromised. So packaging, you know, by storing it isn't punctured or bent. Label the sterilized items with a load number that indicates the sterilizer used, the cycle number, the date of sterilization, and if applicable, the expiration date. The shelf life of a packaged sterile item really depends on the quality of the wrapper. 
and the storage conditions, the conditions during transport, the amount of handling, and other events that can compromise the integrity of the package. So be sure to document the expiration of the packaging as well if that applies. Make sure that you're evaluating packaging before use for any loss of integrity, for example, if it's wet or torn. And again, if the integrity of the packaging is compromised in any way, sterilize the item again and repack. So following suit, we will take a moment again to reflect on different surfaces that you have come in contact with in your specific workplace that require sterilization. A little less common than disinfection, but what sterilization methods do you use in your facility? Do you have to clean those items first? And who performs the sterilization? Is it the person that performs the procedure? Is it dedicated EVS staff? If you feel comfortable, you can go ahead and put some of that in your chat. Okay, so it looks like um, some places use an autoclave and steam under pressure. Any items that we haven't really discussed that you'd potentially sterilize? Think about that. Continue to put that in the chat if you'd like. But we'll move along to our takeaways. So our key takeaways for today, hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand sanitizer is the preferred method in healthcare settings. There are certain circumstances where hand washing must be performed, and it's important to know when those circumstances are. Cleaning removes visible dirt. Disinfecting kills germs on surfaces or objects. And sterilization kills all forms of life on surfaces or objects. And lastly, follow the product labels. So for a certificate of training, only when you have completed the pre-session survey, attended the webinar, you're all here, and completed the post-session survey, you will be eligible for the certificate of training. The post-session survey will be emailed tomorrow, June 6th. Please complete this by June 12th at midnight. And then the certificate of training will be in the form of a PDF sent via email on June 15th. So Project First Line is continuing to build our pre-recorded library on our website, projectfirstlineri.com, as well as provide live webinars and custom created materials to fit your healthcare facility needs. So please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn to learn about exciting new infection control content and webinars. And speaking of, on June 12th, which is next Monday from 12 to 1, Jacob Pagaro, a Project First Line training liaison, will be presenting the same material that was just presented to you in today's webinar, but in Spanish. So if you have enjoyed this session, if you found it useful, please spread the word and share with your Spanish-speaking colleagues. These are the references for today's session. And if you could please take a moment to fill out the brief end of session poll. Again, I thank you so much for being a part of this learning community and look forward to seeing you all in future sessions.